Good morning, Shamar. Dr. Ward, and um, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to the, uh, the Barbados Internet Governance Forum. I believe this is number four. Um, and I'm really honored to, to be able to speak today on measuring the internet reach, reliability, and resilience. Um, as you mentioned, I am the Secretary General of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. Hope you can hear me well. Uh, okay, so what is the CTU? The CTU, just to give a context, the CTU is a regional intergovernmental organization. It's uh, based in Trinidad and Tobago. So it's an institution of CARICOM. Um, not still not as well known as I would like it to be, but we are getting there. But we are an institution of CARICOM focused on information and communication technology established in 1989. 20 member states in the region. Um, there are other specialized institutions of CARICOM, including CARICOM Impacts, which looks at crime and security. There's CARFA, the public health, and there's CAR CARDI, agriculture, and so on. So within CARICOM, there are various specialized institutions that help the region move forward and cooperate in various areas. For us, we look at the harmonization of ICT policy and legislation. So. As you move from Barbados to Trinidad and Jamaica, how can we ensure that there is uh, there are common approaches, there are common policies, common regulation and legislation within the single space? And what that does, of course, is that it, it provides a level of predictability for those pan-Caribbean um, companies that want to operate in multiple markets. But it also allows and facilitates the freedom of movement. If you're doing a business and you want to do business in Barbados and Trinidad and Jamaica, then you're not faced with a different set of requirements and hurdles and so on, uh, in particular in the ICT space. Uh, but recently, we were able to successfully negotiate the drastic reduction in roaming charges within CARICOM, uh, something that we've been trying to do for years. Um, uh, so that, and we want to move actually to complete elimination of roaming within within the single space. We're also moving towards the, the establishment of a regional regulatory body that helps in terms of standardization of telecommunications regulation. We also do capacity development. So we host a number of workshops and training sessions at all levels. Our primary focus is on ministers um, because we know that, I mean, we would accept that ministers are not necessarily experts in this sub in the subject matter. So a minister may take responsibility for information technology or telecoms, but they don't necessarily have that background. And the same applies for agriculture, tourism, all of that. And therefore, how are you able to bring, make them aware of new and evolving technologies like 5G and artificial intelligence? What are the issues on cybersecurity? And you gear the presentation at that level. Uh, what are the implications for policy? And, and there, of course, are the policy makers. So we do a lot of capacity building there, but also at a technical level as well. We work with like carrot log and so on to be with the engineers uh, to you know, roll up our sleeves and get down into DNS and RPKI and all of that. We do regional ICT project coordination. Uh, we've done work with the OECS countries on establishing fiber networks to connect the islands. We've done work on um, uh, spectrum in terms of harmonizing the spectrum allocations throughout, throughout the region. Representation, another uh, aspect of our work, which is we represent the Caribbean in international conferences, so such as the UN IGF, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, within the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, uh, where global policies are set. And therefore, we, it's important for us to have a voice there. Not all member states are active, not all member states go, but we try to ensure that if they don't go, that we at least are there to say, look, this is a regional position on this that issue or that issue, we support this or that policy. Um, yes, and I will mention that again later. And Industry Watch, we have a research unit that looks at what is happening within the industry, whether it's in terms of competition, the number of players, the internet penetration, and we are actually trying to establish regional ICT indicators, which is the focus of this presentation this morning. We are also home to the oldest internet governance forum in the world. Um, 
the Caribbean Internet Governance Forum, uh, celebrating 20 years next year. The UN actually uh, celebrated, I think it was 18th IGF this year. So we're a year ahead of the world in terms of this whole discussion on, on the forum on internet governance. Um, <clears throat> it is multi-stakeholder. We had one uh, August this year, and uh, it focuses on harmonization of internet governance policy regionally. Um, there is an internet governance policy framework, and, and I'll get to that here in, the, in terms of the achievements. Um, we've evolved over the years, and uh, since, in fact, we've held the uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, youth, our second youth in Caribbean Youth Internet Governance Forum, and last year, the first Small Island Developing States Internet Governance Forum. Oh, one second. Okay. Um, so we have also developed an internet governance policy framework, which provides um, a number of policy recommendations for our governments to consider with respect to the issue of internet governance. Um, we've had technical and policy sessions with 18 countries working in partnership with the Internet Society, the American Registry for Internet Numbers, ICANN, which is the Internet Corporation for Assigning the Numbers, LACNIC, uh, Packet Clearing House, NIC.PR, and um, we posted as well in collaboration with the South School of Internet Governance, a South School of Internet Governance in 2014. We've promoted and advocated for the establishment of internet exchange points. Uh, I'm not sure of the number now, but um, yeah, I think we're in the region of about 14 or so uh, internet exchange points, which really did not exist. Um, before the Internet Governance Forum started. All right, so I will move on in the interest of time. Right, here we go. So this is um, just a few weeks ago, in fact, our participation in the UN Internet Governance Forum in Kyoto. Uh, it was the 18th annual Internet Governance Forum, whereas we celebrated our 19th this year. Um, we had a booth there. Um, the bottom left, well, my left anyway, is a picture of us with the Secretary General of the International Telecoms Union who stopped by our booth. Um, at the top left also, we are on a panel discussion. We actually had an open forum on the evolution of the Internet Governance Forum towards the Global Digital Compact, or GDC, which is a compact that is being uh, discussed, presented at the UN next year, uh, the Summit of the Future. And we've been involved in that process, putting forward suggestions on how this global digital compact can work for small states. So we're very pleased to participate in that uh, IGF, UN IGF in Kyoto this year. Um, just a little throwback here. Um, there was a publication in 2017, I believe, Unleashing the Internet in the Caribbean. Uh, an ISOC publication. Um, the CEO of ISOC came, Kathy Brown at the time, came to Barbados, uh, worked with the ISOC Barbados chapter to launch this report and we see Shona Nosepa, who at the time was the basically the regional representative for, for ISOC, who actually, by the way, was very instrumental in helping me in terms of information for this presentation. I believe he's on right now. And thank you very much, um, Shona. And we're working with him in various various uh, projects, including uh, issues of cybersecurity and capacity building in the Caribbean. Uh, and this was at the University of the West Indies. We also, um, well, not C2, but I was also, as Jamar mentioned, the chair of the Barbados chapter, and we launched the Internet Governance Forum in 2017. At the time, Darcy Boyce was the minister, <clears throat> Senator the Honorable Darcy Boyce, was the minister of responsibility for ICTs. And on that occasion, we honored Bernadette Lewis, the first female Secretary General of the CTU. And um, and the we honored Alan Emptich, who is a Barbadian, you would know, I'm sure, who invented the first um, search engine. So he predated Google and all of these things. And in fact, he was inducted in the Internet Hall of Fame that very same year. So there are some videos up there with the launch and so on. Uh, where we honored him. 
and where he actually does respond, uh, gives, gives us a reply because he was not able to join us in Barbados. Uh, this is the second Internet Governance Forum, 2018. Um, just a panel discussion here, I see uh, Gabriela Bedefit, um, and the guy on the far right is uh, the head of the Digital Identity Authority for Estonia. Uh, this was held at the University of the West Indies, uh, Cape Hill School of Business, Sadiqa School of Business. This was the last one that was held, um, so I'm really pleased that we are sort of back on the road with respect to the IGFs. Um, this was in 2019, I believe. And we held it as part of Smart Barbados uh, with the support of the Ministry of Innovation Science, so Smart Technology, uh, with the support of the International Business Association, the Chamber of Commerce, Small Business Association, of course, the Internet Society Barbados chapter. And uh, we had Nancy Kuros from ISOP coming to Barbados to, to speak, and you see all of the support that we had there. So moving on to the topic specifically today, uh, what are the CQ? What has the CQ done in terms of these this whole idea of measuring? Uh, because if you're not measuring what you're doing, then you're sort of you're shooting in the dark. You're not sure where you're going. If you're making progress, uh, so on. And we held a workshop last year on monitoring and evaluation framework for ICT indicators in the Caribbean. And it sought to outline the process for member states to identify ICT indicators and targets that align with the goals and objectives of their national ICT strategic plans. Of course, that's for those who have strategic plans nationally. Uh, not all of them do. In fact, maybe the majority don't. But at least you want to know what your priorities are with respect to information and communication technology. Where do you want to position your country? Um, and based on those, then let's start measuring, see if you're making progress. And so we worked also in March this year with the with ECLAC, the Economic UN Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, um, to host a workshop on measuring the digital society for digital inclusion. Uh, of course, the whole thrust globally is to ensure uh, not that those who have internet access uh, have access because they do, but we are focused on those that don't have access and how can we make this digital development more inclusive. And uh, the indicators will measure the levels of digital inclusion, and it will serve as an input into the evidence-based policy formulation and decision-making. So based on uh, the results of this data, we will be able to inform policymakers of necessary interventions that are necessary to ensure that our development is inclusive. Um, then very recently in June, we conducted a survey in, with this partnership, in partnership with ECLAP uh, measuring the digital society through ICT indicators to advance digital inclusion, a Caribbean assessment. And 11 member states participated in the study. Subsequent to that study, there's a report. It's been um, drafted. We are reviewing it before it's published. And um, I think it will be published before the end of the year, but it will identify those uh, priority areas and the various indicators that we want to collect. Uh, under those priority areas to, to sort of measure the information society. At the international level, there is the ITU's International Development Index, or the IDU, IDI. Um, and at the Plenty Potential Conference last year in Bucharest, which we had a very strong showing from the Caribbean, about 69 people in, in the Caribbean delegation, uh, in particular because we have a candidate running for one of the top positions. Uh, we were not successful, but uh, we put up a very good, a very good showing. Um, and, you know, we're going up, up against some very powerful countries and so on. So our candidate was number two, basically. And um, it was a hard fight and it went to three rounds and so on. But that's a story for another day. But at this conference, uh, Resolution 131 of the ITU focused on a new methodology for the International Development in Index, which basically is a global framework for measuring progress in information and communication technology. And the ITU basically wanted to revamp uh, what they were doing uh, to ensure that it was relevant and fit for purpose and so on. Um, there's a number of meetings which we participated in and which we continue to participate in um, with a view to um, <clears throat> giving an input to the relaunch of this new IDI and of course ensure that our member states are reporting on the IDI so that we can see how we're doing 
in comparison to countries like Singapore, UK, US, Canada, and so on. Uh, right, so let's move on. So what do you want to measure the internet? We want to understand uh, the state of the internet in the in the Caribbean, certainly in Barbados, but from where we sit, from all, all of the Caribbean, we want to know how we're doing in comparison to the rest of the world, uh, in comparison to each other, are we making progress or not? Um, reach. Uh, achieved through different access technologies such as wired, whether you have access wired, wireless, satellite, mobile access. What is it, well, how do you access the internet and what are the primary channels through which you access the internet? And of course, these will give you different quality of service, uh, wired versus wireless. If you're wired on fiber, you know you can get speeds in Barbados up to a gigabit, I believe. Uh, I think that's what I'm paying for here. <laughs> and um, the quality of experience as well. So not just the service, but your whole experience. Uh, if there's a problem, in fact, even in getting your service back up. And resilience, uh, ability to recover, uh, so on. If there is a break in the international fiber, and that's where we spoke about internet exchange points and the value of those IXPs in supporting internet resilience. Um, if there is a cyber attack, if there's a break on the fiber, if there's a natural disaster, um, hurricane, of course, we're very prone to that. And what is the level of resilience? And those things we need to measure and work to improve. Um, these are some stats here, and I'll provide you links. Um, thanks, Shirley, uh, for some data in the Caribbean. Um, see Haiti, Barbados there, 85.8. Um, you know, we boast about fiber to the home in Barbados everywhere. Um, we have so much fiber in Barbados. Um, I shouldn't make a fiber joke, but we have a lot of fiber in Barbados. There's serious, very good internet penetration, and I think the issue is lack of affordability. And in fact, I was a part of the flow, launched uh, an initiative called Jump. Um, I think that was in maybe September, losing track of time. But they have launched an initiative to subsidize internet service for the poorest, some of the poorest communities in Barbados. But not just pay for the subsidize the internet, but also provide them with devices. And the pandemic was. Um, an inflection point where we recognize that there are many, many homes in Barbados without, still without internet access because of affordability, still without devices. There were pitched students trying to do attend class on Google Classroom and so on and Zoom using a parent's mobile phone and um, so on. And then, of course, the environment itself was not always conducive to that. So uh, we still have issues in Barbados as well with respect to penetration. Very good, very high above the global average, but um, issues of affordability still exist. We have challenges, of course, in the Caribbean, like in Barbados, like the rest of the Caribbean, on cybersecurity. Um, still, many attacks are, are perpetrated on our critical infrastructure, famous the QEH um, ransomware attack, some pretty high profile retail. Um, businesses and so on that have been impacted. So there's a lot of work that we have to do there. Um, on the reliability, we need a holistic approach, deployment of resilient telecoms and internet infrastructures. Again, I mentioned how do we respond to natural disasters. Uh, the point is made here that the a lot of our infrastructure is above ground. Uh, and in fact, last year, I was in St. Bart's. I think it's St. Bart's where a lot of their infrastructure is now being placed underground. It's a huge investment, but it's really an investment in the future and an investment in the resiliency of the infrastructure. Because the terrestrial fiber is just the, well, the overhead fiber is um, is just too vulnerable to the high winds and so on. And of course, the electricity goes hand in hand and we need to ensure that the electricity grid is uh, pretty resilient as well. Uh, we've been working with the CTU to promote innovative access solutions uh, such as community networks, LEO satellites. Um, you know, Starlink has just gotten a license to operate in Barbados. I don't know if you want anyone on the call has the service. I do actually have a service here uh, as a, sort of a backup, really. Um, and they had approached me as well pretty early because they wanted to collaborate with the government of Barbados. And I think they are doing some work with CDEMA. Uh, which is the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. 
And that agreement allows them to move with these devices uh, in the event of a disaster in one of our islands, they can move and get internet connectivity using the Starlink uh, devices. Uh, and of course, outside of the emergency, is the LEOs provide connectivity to rural areas. Um, we don't have what I consider to be rural areas in Barbados, right? Unless you go down to Pike Barnes St. Lucie. But uh, I'm from Christchurch. I, I don't really see that there are rural communities in Barbados you can get anywhere in half an hour. Contrast that to Guyana, uh, to Suriname, to Belize, uh, where you can drive for four hours, five hours. There are remote communities. There's local government uh, administration and so on. We've been working through the Spectrum Management Task Force to promote harmonized spectrum and innovative access solutions. So how can we cr creatively offer spectrum to uh, give access to communities that really need it, all right? Rather than one rigid spectrum management regime that says this is it, but some flexibility that gives concessions to those companies that are willing to go into rural areas. And uh, of course, we work with our governments and policymakers to raise awareness of the connectivity issues and gaps, uh, collaborate with partners and donors to promote investment in telecoms and internet infrastructure. So this concessionary funding in the World Bank, we work on CARSIP, as I mentioned, uh, to promote connectivity through World Bank uh, funding for the some of the OECS countries. Uh, we also collaborate with ICANN. We are actively participating in the Governmental Advisory Committee, and actually ICANN 79, 78, 79, I think, is happening this week. I just got off a get call this morning. In fact, they start about 3 o'clock in the morning, where this time. And... Um, Within the gap, they're looking at issues of DNS abuse and public safety and so on. Um, and I'm not sure if ICANN is doing a presentation within this IGF, but you know they, they will tell you of the role of ICANN, what it does in, on the DNS and uh, its role in cybersecurity. We collaborate with Aaron and Latnik as well. We do some executive briefings with our ministers on the issues of concern, uh, the trends in cybersecurity. Uh, other partners, of course, include ISOC and ITU. There is the Organization of American States, and we work with them regarding um, cybersecurity strategies, national cybersecurity strategies, and their implementation. There is a draft cybersecurity strategy for Barbados. I'm not sure if it's been approved and if the, if the implementation has started, but under MIST, the OAS has helped uh, to develop a national cybersecurity strategy. We work with other partners, such as the Global Forum on Cybersecurity Experts, uh, ISACA, um, the Global Cybersecurity Forum, which is a forum hosted in Saudi Arabia annually uh, to help to, in terms of building capacity at the level of policymakers, um, but also at the technical level as well. And Shernan is actually going to Ghana, representing the CTU and the Caribbean at a GC, GFCE forum being hosted there in Accra. And that's next month, November. Um, and of course, we reach out to member states, raising awareness through webinars, through involvement in the national IGS like I'm doing here today. Um, we work with Canto, which is the Caribbean Network Operators Association. Um, they, they're really a private sector grouping for the telcos, which are obviously their own and manage the infrastructure. And we participate within the Canto meetings and work with them to help promote internet resilience. There are things like the Tampere Convention that we encourage our member states to join as well, which allows for the free movement of telecoms um, devices. Um, you have advanced customs clearance and so on in the event of disaster, so you're not bogged down with trying to move equipment. Um, and of course, I mentioned we collaborate with Sedema, uh, ISOC terms of community networks, ITU, ECLAP on the indicators and so on, they need to measure the internet. Um, we have the ISOC study that was done in 2017, and I'm advocating for a new study to be done and for it to be broader in terms of its scope. Uh, here are a few references um, for where some of this data has been taken from. Uh, I will actually add some more links and share it with, because uh, there are some references I did I didn't um, but all the links here, but I will do that and share it with Shamar and so that it's available for you. And that in a nutshell is 
um, stop sharing is what we have been doing uh, with respect to ICT indicators. Uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. Uh, back over to you, Shimon. Thank you very much, Rodney. Um, so I'm going to open the floor now um, for any questions we may have as it relates to um, whether it be measuring the internet, the work of the CTU. Um, I'm opening the floor for any questions anyone um, may have. I'll first start by saying though, Rodney, I think that that is something that we often not just forget, but um, in many of our spaces, we may not recognize how many persons are still without um, internet access in Barbados. You know, it's, it's, sometimes it floats in the money and yeah, most persons or all persons are, are connected to the internet, but it is actually true, not, not the case at all. Um, so it's good that programs are being implemented to um to address that 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 challenge i see um mr heinz has his hand up um jason please go ahead hi good morning good morning great presentation thank you very much um you. what came to my mind as i saw it i was wondering if you have any good cases of local instances in any countries of 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 them um really um taking deep dives into measuring their um their internet penetration and and their security and so on if you have any um off the top of your head examples of that thanks um sorry unfortunately i don't um we don't have a strong sort of culture of measuring um and monitoring and evaluation uh i remember when i was with miss we were doing some work with the government of Estonia, and the first thing they sought to do was measure our level of cybersecurity resilience. And if you go, I'll share the link before this meeting is over. Um, they've done some comparisons with Barbados and a number of other Caribbean countries on there. Um, but a lot of what we do is driven by international requirements. So the ITU has their international their um, IT ICT indicators. And we report through that because we don't want to be left out. But as a national imperative, there isn't a lot. The, the statistical services as well measure a lot of stuff they may measure. And the regulators will do some measurement in terms of penetration of internet, uh, telephone lines, telephone lines. Yes, that has a digital inclusion survey. That is one of the, I would say, more advanced regulators. So they, they measure it because they have to measure it as regulators. But nationally, there isn't a focus on it. You'll find more an anecdotal, you know, approaches uh, and more assumptions and so on. We want to change that to make it more at the national level to be very measured uh, in, in what we're doing so that we can determine if our policies are successful or if they're failing. And of course, many governments don't want to admit if their policies are failing and if they need to pivot and do, do something different. So unfortunately, I don't. But I can point to a few cases where um, measures are measurements are being taken for various uh, for various reasons. So I hope that um, addresses your question in some way. Thank you very much for that question and response, um, Rodney. Um, so we have another question in, in the chat. We'll take another question. We have a question from Carol Roach. Can you indicate some of the indicators um, which are measured in the surveys that you referenced in your presentation? Okay, yes, she's going to call. And my, my power of recall at this moment, there are 10 different priority areas and several indicators under them. So I... Uh, the, the study isn't ready to be published. It'll be published soon. But it measures the, the basics as you would expect, internet penetration, speeds and rates. And um, it looks into gender as well. Um, so male versus female access. Uh, so on mobile versus fixed, fixed wireless. Um, those are the core things. Um, cybersecurity, 
all of that. Uh, I don't I don't have it to my fingertips, but there are, like I said, 10 priority areas that have been identified, and each of these priority areas has its own set of indicators. The ITU has, I mean, it's hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of indicators that you can measure, um, separate mobile from fixed, fixed wireless, um, satellites, um, and, and all of this. So, so there are quite a few. So, sorry, I did I can't get into all of them, and I and I don't remember specifically coming out of the ECLAC study which ones we have agreed upon, uh, but it came out of a process where we looked at the priority areas in the region, and then how do we, what do we need to measure if we are to see uh, progress within that within that um, space? Sure. All right. Thank you for that. Rodney, and we have one final question that we'll we'll take, and this is from um, our treasurer, Mr. St. Hill. Given the type of monopolies in the telecommunications sector in Barbados and the Caribbean, how easy is it to get the relevant data that policymakers can use to make informed choices? You got the question or you want me to read it again? Yeah, I, I got it, I got it. Um... The monopolies still have to report to regulators, um, but we do need, so there's data that the regulators have. They're not always free to share that data, even with government, believe it or not. So as a regulator, you'd be privy to certain information, even in terms of reliability. And some of this data is competitive, competitive data. So let's say in Barbados, where you have the two major players, Digicel and, and Flow. Uh, yeah, Digicel and Flow, um, data on network coverage, on quality of service, how many dropouts they have, um, all of that is sort of, you can use that for a competitive advantage. You know, I mean, the cell markets itself as the bigger, better network, um, and so on. And, you know, very often you're paying for 500 megs with some of these providers and getting 100. Um, so these things are, can be used for marketing and competitive advantage. So. Some of this, some of this information is held uh, closely to the, the regulators hold, hold it closely, and they use it in order to regulate, but it is not made public, or it's not even shared with government departments. So it's not necessarily that because there is these not, not monopolies but duopolies. Um, <clears throat> inputs from the regulators, but we also need to independently do even household surveys, for example, so we can talk to people who actually have access to the service and talk to them about the quality of their service and quality of experience. Uh, so it goes beyond just getting information from the telcos, uh, but in some cases, actually even installing devices and probes so that you can monitor and see in real time how the internet uh, service is, is performing. So. I wouldn't say that our situation is unique or creates a problem with these duopolies, but I would say it's sort of the regulatory framework that we have and, and the need for us to implement more robust uh, measuring, monitoring evaluation uh, frameworks. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, um, Rodney. Also, um, the Deputy Secretary General um, has placed um, a link to the Data Hub from ITU with a range of measurements in the chat. So if you're interested in more information, please feel free to go to the link in the chat and you will be able to get some more information on the measurements and the indicators which are covered um, by such a study. And we'll take one final question. Um, that is from um, our vice chair, um, Captain Donovan Smith. Quick question. What technologies are used for connectivity? Is it all fiber or? There are still copper penetrations, microwave. Is this also used for statistical penetrative gathering? Yeah. Um, well, if you're talking about Barbados, <clears throat> Barbados is about having fiber to the home, right, everywhere. There isn't a community in Barbados that is not connected, even to the last mile uh, on fiber. That is what my understanding is. Um, so we ripped out all the copper. Um, I don't know. If any still like this, but there's there's fiber. Of course, there are the Leo satellite services that are now like Starlink that have been licensed to operate in Barbados. So there's satellite connectivity as well. Um, but beyond these Leos, even for for disaster, there are the uh, traditional satellite services. But that's um, 
that's uh, quite expensive. So that's not for the average average Joe. Um, that's really for disaster management and for corporations and that kind of thing. Um, those doing um, oil exploration uh, out, out at sea, out at sea, etc. So those are sort of the range. I think we have done away in Barbados with copper, but of course, copper is still very much in use, uh, even in Trinidad, in Tobago. I believe copper comes to our office. Um, so there are a range of things, but in Barbados specifically, we have a very, very good coverage in terms of uh, fiber fiber penetration. We have excellent, I think, as I mentioned, I pay for a gigabit here. Uh, my house, where I am right now, is tonight. And um, no issues in terms of the quality of the infrastructure that we have in Barbados, but it is to, uh, the affordability is more of an issue in terms, rather than the infrastructure itself. Thank you. All right.